Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Connie. Glad you could join us. Good morning, Ashley. Yeah, Psalm 23 today, which is a pretty uh, well-known psalm. I think any news around here today, Jim Ekman's in rehab and Gary Cheek remains hospitalized. Um, Terry Barkley's recovering from surgery and Pastor Bernthal's going to begin cancer treatments and um, you know, keep uh, Galen and Mary Knoll's daughter in our prayer, needing surgery but trying to find a surgeon to do that. Oh, that's a challenge. Hello, Aunt Alma. Glad you could join us this morning from up in Cleveland. We're studying Psalm 23 today, if you want to turn to that. And we always send out a little worksheet, too, with our psalm on it. If anyone ever wants that, um, just let us know. And there's my little buzzer that says it's about time. So glad you can join us here this morning, and I'm sure we'll have others checking in as we go along here. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, if you know anything about sheep, when the Lord calls us sheep and that he's our shepherd, it's not the greatest compliment to us that we're sheep. <laughs> um, you know, sheep aren't the smartest of animals, especially domesticated sheep. Um, in fact, uh, a friend was telling me that uh, Good Morning Spears um, was sheep that he would sometimes, you know, try to take them, get them to go in another pasture. There was a fence between the pasture and the gate would be opened over on the left hand side. He would put the pile of food, uh, you know, kind of grain in a trough and the sheep would just stand against the fence. They wouldn't find that gate even though it was only feet away from them to walk into the next field. He would have to just kind of drive them or lead them into that opening to find that next field. Otherwise, they'd just stare across at that food uh, at the fence that was there. So, uh, yeah, happy anniversary to the Spears, too. Let's uh, say a word of prayer. We'll get underway here this morning on Psalm 23. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you truly are a good shepherd and not just any shepherd, a shepherd who was willing to lay down his life for us, the sheep. We pray you might strengthen those who are in need of your healing hand. Um, we know too, Lord, that our nation not only needs a physical healing, we need a spiritual healing as well from some of the things that we've been going through. So grant that to us and uh, be with those who are hospitalized and shut in and just pray you might strengthen them in their faith and trust in you here today as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so Psalm 23, one of the best known psalms. And actually, you know, uh, this is one that I always lament that we have translations. Because sometimes those translations... I don't know, they don't do as well as the old King James uh, and the way I learned it. So let's just read through the psalm and then we'll just take it verse by verse. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And still I'm doing the King James Version. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we regularly say that when we were doing nursing home devotions, because practically everyone knows it. Uh, and also we use it a lot for uh, memorial services and funeral services as well. Yeah, so a Psalm of David, it says at the heading of this in our uh, Bibles. And uh, if you take a look at this Psalm, this Psalm is written from the perspective of, and I put careful here, you want to want to guess? A lot of people would say, oh, it's a, from, from the perspective of a shepherd. It's not really, though. It's written from the perspective of a sheep. Yeah. And the Lord is my shepherd. Kind of interesting there that David uh, was a shepherd himself, but he writes this like he's a sheep and God is a shepherd, which is the, the right perspective for us, isn't it? In Psalm 78, you just have this little note about David says uh, he or God chose David his servant and took him from the pasture folds, I think the word is. Psalm 78. I've got my right handy man here. I didn't write that down, this word myself. Seven sheep folds. Okay. From the sheep folds. From following the nursing ewes, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. With upright heart, David shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. So that just uh, repeats something we know from David's life story that he took care of the sheep for his family. And in fact, when he was anointed king of Israel to succeed Saul, they had to go find him, taking care of the flocks. All the other brothers were there thinking they might be, be chosen to be the next king, but uh, they had to go call David because he was taking care of the lambs out in that field. So while David was being a shepherd, you know, his brothers were serving as soldiers for the king. So what lesson is there for us in regard to vocation in that regard? You know, if, if that was even in daily life today, and one son was taking care of the farm, and the others were off uh, fighting uh, as soldiers in the Air Force or Army or uh, National Guard or Navy, what would we say about who's who's doing the more important work? You know, we might be tempted to say, oh, hey, you know, those folks who are soldiers, you know, they're doing important work. And that guy who's, uh, you know, taking care of sheep, he needs to go get a real job. Uh, but no, what was God doing? He was preparing his, his uh, son, David, for uh, an important task. And so even though it looked like, um, you know, in life sometimes that people aren't doing much with their life, you know, if they're, if they're working hard um, and doing their best with what they're doing, if they're not being lazy or sloppy about their work, um, you know, God says that's a wonderful vocation. We need people as waiters and waitresses and gas station attendants and, you know, in all manner of jobs. and. All of them are very important. Um, so uh, vocations, no matter whether you're, where you're called to be a father or mother, son or daughter, or, uh, you know, your governor or president, every one of us has a role to play. So who are some of the other vocational shepherds God used as his servants in the Old Testament? Can you think about this for a second? Who else was a shepherd besides David in the Bible? Well, one of the first ones was, yeah, Abel, really. Cain and Abel, I don't even put that one down, actually. Another one a little bit later, Abraham. Remember, he had his flocks, and Lot had his flocks. In fact, they had so many flocks, at one point they had to kind of split and go their own ways. So uh, Abraham was a shepherd as well. Um, Genesis 37, later on... There's a young man watching the sheep, and suddenly his brothers came and sold him into slavery. Remember who that was? Joseph? Yep. 
And then a few chapters later, when um, Joseph moves his whole family to Egypt, he's telling Pharaoh, listen, you know, all of my people are shepherds. And it's interesting to read. And the Egyptians didn't think very highly of shepherds. They kind of looked down upon them. In fact, I think Joseph even told them, you know, when you go in front of Pharaoh and he asks you what you do, don't don't tell him you're a shepherd. Um, tell him that you're you're watching herds, you know, cattle. Um, just sounds better. So it's interesting that the nation of Israel was kind of known for t- taking care of sheep. And then Exodus chapter three. You know, might know from that book who that's talking about. Uh, later on, when God appears to him in the burning bush, Moses. Yeah, he's out tending the flocks of Jethro, his uh, father-in-law. So God has a propensity to use shepherds. And the nation of Israel is kind of known for keeping flocks as well, uh, which plays well into the story of the Bible, isn't it? So uh, in Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 23, we have this prophecy that God's going to send a Savior, and the Savior would feed his people and be their shepherd. Yeah, so the promised Savior, you know, somebody just asked me the other day, okay, how are the people in the Old Testament saved? Well, they were saved the same way. In, in, a, in a way, the way we are. They, they looked ahead in faith to the Savior. We look back in faith at that same Savior. So we're all saved by faith. They, when we're looking ahead to the coming of the Savior. We're looking back on the Savior who's already come. And everyone is saved by faith and trust that Jesus lived the perfect life in our replacement. And he also died the replacement death for us on the cross. Um, so yeah, this, this Messiah, this Savior was going to be a shepherd. And then in uh, verse 1, let's just take this a little bit at a time. And, you know, really, we see this psalm is broken up into two parts. One, talking about sheep and shepherd. And the second, the last couple of verses, it almost sounds like a a host and a guest eating at a meal. And so a little bit of a transition there. Some try to make those last verses fit into the shepherd theme, but I almost think it sounds better that, you have a picture of, okay, now we're at a banquet table for these last couple. So the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or the NIV says, I lack nothing. Yeah, that's that's pretty good translation. You know, I still like not changing these words too much because I grew up with them. I shall not want. But uh, yeah, it's basically saying I'm going to lack nothing when the Lord's taken care of me. So what is this picture here? Well, I think uh, the shepherd taking care of his sheep is pretty similar to a father or mother taking care of their children, right? So what does that mean? That uh, your children aren't, are going to lack nothing or they shall not want. Does it mean, oh, your kid asks for a motorcycle? You say, sure, I'm going to give you one. Right? You're going to say, no, you're not getting a motorcycle. You know, if you get older and you want to buy one yourself, that's another thing. But I'm not going to buy one, you know. Uh, we don't give them everything, but we do take care of them to make sure they have enough food and enough water. And they might want ice cream every night. We might say no to that as well. Um, so when God says, uh, there's nothing I shall want, you know, I lack nothing. It doesn't mean that he continues to pour on us millions of dollars. But, he, for, you know, as the Bible says, with food and clothing, we shall be content. Right? Um, so it's interesting, you know, how does Satan portray God differently in the pages of scripture? Remember the story in the Garden of Eden? Here, Adam and Eve literally do have paradise on earth. But Satan comes to them and says, you know, there's one thing you don't have. That's that tree in the middle of the garden. And God doesn't want you to have it because he knows that you'll be as wise as he is. And what's what's Satan doing there? He's striking up this picture that, oh, I don't have everything I want, you know. Um, There's a few things out there God is keeping from me. He's not so nice and kind. And uh, the devil works like that. Makes us think, you know, 
I deserve better than I'm getting. No, the picture is really, we don't deserve anything we get. You know, we deserve because of our sin, far worse. Um, and then in Matthew chapter 4, remember Jesus is out in the wilderness being tempted. The Holy Spirit sent him there. And what is the temp, uh, what does Satan tempt him with? You know, you really could turn those stones into bread. You know, God's not providing for you. You might as well provide for yourself. Or, hey, look over all these kingdoms. I can give this to you. You know, God's not going to give it to you, but I will. You know, and Satan is like that. He makes us think that our needs that we have, or, or excuse me, tries to change, convert once into needs. Uh, you you need a lot more than God has given you. And you should be dissatisfied. I mean, look at some of the pagans in the world, how much they have and how little you have. What's God doing for you? What's the last the time he did anything for you? You know, Satan works that way against us, doesn't he? And how does the world portray life differently than this verse? Well, boy, you know, all our advertisers, their goal is to make us feel like our wants are basically needs, right? Oh, you want to have sex appeal then? Use this toothpaste, right? Like, toothpaste is going to do that? Um, or you really want to look spiffy and stand out? Or, hey, look at these fashions. You know, get the latest. Our, our world is constantly selling us or trying to sell us things, too, to think, you know, you, you really need this mop. You're not really living until you have this particular mop because look how people are smiling when they're cleaning their floors. Um and that's the way advertisers work. And the Lord says, listen, I shall not want. Um, so when God speaks to his people about, okay, in Deuteronomy, they're getting near the end of their 40 years. And uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 7b, it says, you know, these 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. You have lacked nothing. Caused your shoes not to wear out. Remember they were hungry. God took care of that. Remember how? Gave them bread to eat and manna. And also quail. They needed water. He provided that for them out there. And you can imagine how much water must have been needed by a million people in a desert. That must have been a pretty good stream. Um, so these 40 years you have lacked nothing. And then Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 7 and 9. You know, the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, Moses tells the people. A land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs, flowing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you'll eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing yeah where is that place it's called ohio no we don't have any pomegranates i don't think in ohio uh yeah there's some pretty nice places to live in in the world right but the promised land i mean when these spies went into the land and then carried out a bunch of grapes on a pole that two men had to carry you know i haven't bought any grapes like that at kroger um so the lord said listen out in the desert, you've had something, and I've taken care of you. When you go to the promised land, wow, there's going to be bounty there. Probably unimaginable bounty that the world has ever known. So we want to say, okay, I lack nothing, but we got to be careful about these things, right? Because in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, uh, Moses also reminds the people, you know, sometimes the Lord humbled you and let you hunger. Yeah, sometimes he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna. So sometimes the Lord made them thirsty so they'd appreciate what God was giving them. Or they hungered and then God fed them so that they would understand it wasn't their smarts that was getting them food. It wasn't their wisdom that was allowing them to do well in the desert. God was taking care of them. So in life, what should we expect sometimes? Sometimes the Lord has to teach us lessons too, right? Now, sometimes he has to withdraw his blessings so we appreciate what we have. Maybe some folks have gone through that here 
and all this COVID things with closing of businesses and loss of jobs. And hopefully they're coming back. Um, but lots of people in life have, you know, gotten the pink slip and learned a lesson. Well, maybe I shouldn't have complained so much about my job. Um, the Lord teaches us lessons. He disciplines those he loves. Uh, Elizabeth L. Elliot once talked about visiting a friend who uh, was Welch and he raised sheep for a living. And as he was uh, taking care of his sheep, here they had the, the fence narrowed and narrowed and narrowed until you could only get one sheep through. And then that led to a trough up a ramp and into a trough with this liquid in it, water and some chemicals to kill lice and bugs that infested sheep. So the sheep would walk into that and, you know, they'd hold their head up, to keep their nose above the water. But then the shepherd would take the head of the sheep and plunge it down under the water. Why? Because, you know, their neck and everything has to be covered. Their ears have to be treated with the same chemical. And, of course, the sheep, they thought they were drowning and dying. They thought, this shepherd's going to kill me. Um, and finally, they let the head up of that sheep. Uh, but that was the way they had to treat it. So did the shepherd hate his sheep? No, he was doing this out of love. Did the sheep understand what was going on? No, not at all, right? So in life, what happens? Do we ever go through some really hard times? And do we understand always the whys behind those? Oh, you know, God's putting together the pages of history. And why did he scatter the Israelites all over the Mediterranean um, after calling him his people? Well, he was kind of laying the foundation for Paul and the apostles to go out and find these groups of Jews and then to establish congregations of Christians. You know, there was a reason behind him scattering all of his people. But did the Jews understand that? No. You know, they thought, where is God in the midst of this? Where is God in the midst of this pandemic? You know, where is God in the midst of all this racial divide that's going on? You know, pray that the Lord can work some good out of these things. And in our personal lives as well. Okay. So uh, verse 2, that was a lot in verse 1. Verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Now, Philip Keller, you might have heard of this book. He's written a book on Psalm 23 entitled Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. So he grew up in East Africa, Philip Keller did, and then he spent eight years himself as a shepherd. And so he picks apart this psalm here. And he notes, you know, if sheep are lying down, they normally don't eat when they're lying down. I do. Sheep don't, apparently. Um, so if sheep are lying down, it's usually a sign that they're full. You know, they've had enough food. They've had enough water. They're content. They don't need to stay in anymore. And they lie down. Of course, they lie down when they die, too. But uh, basically, if they're lying down in a the field, they just had their fill. They get full, too, if there's good grass. So they've enjoyed sufficient green pastures. They had enjoyed still waters. And he makes a point of uh, sheep tend to not like to drink out of a roaring river or stream. They like water that's kind of placid and calm. And so you don't find that everywhere. But that's what sheep are looking for. And a good shepherd's going to have to find that kind of water. Um, so what accusations does God make against the false teachers or shepherds of Israel? It's interesting. If you look at the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34, God really lays into the leaders of Israel and what they're doing to the nation of Israel. And we'll just read a few words out of Ezekiel, chapter 34. Really, the whole chapter is a pretty picture language. Um, it says, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Who's he talking about? Well, the Levites were supposed to be the shepherds and the prophets. 
Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves. Yeah, they're taking care of themselves, well, but not God's people. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you ruled them. So they were scattered because there were no shepherd, and they became food for the wild beasts. And who's God saying that about? He's saying about the spiritual leaders of Israel. You know, they, they haven't been good shepherds for God's people. And so later on, God says, well, I'm going to take care of that. I'm going to send the shepherd who's going to take care of his people. Uh, so that's Ezekiel chapter 34. And a lot more to that chapter than just those first six verses. So verse 3 of Psalm 23. He restores my soul, or restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name, name's sake. Um, Psalm 19 is a good verse that turns you at this time. And in Psalm 19, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. Um, often in the Psalms, that word, when you read a law, it's talking about the word of the Lord. What's saying, you know, God's word is like food for our souls. It really is, you know. It, it, so often people who have not been Christian, you know, many of them are converted by just going to the scriptures personally on their own and reading the Bible. And God works through those words to fill up their empty lives and yeah, their empty hearts. And if you actually, if you read Psalm 19, verse 8 and 9, you know, it says, The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And, you know, what God has to give us in his word, what we're doing here with Psalm 23 today is, is spiritual food. Uh, we need this kind of food. NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, you know, they can give us news. But it's not food, and probably not even good news most of the time. You know, kind of bad news. Uh, but here, and, and no other religion can give us good news. You know, they can they can all give us good advice. That's the difference between Christianity and all the other religions of the world. All the other religions of the world can give us good advice. Hey, you ought to try this. You ought to follow me. But you know, Christianity is good news. Uh, Jesus saying, "I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one." comes to the Father except through me. Yeah. Um, Romans 3, 21 and 22. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Yeah, those were wonderful words for Martin Luther to find. To find that we can't be righteous by our own doing. That's called self-righteousness. It doesn't work, you know. We can't keep the Ten Commandments. We can learn them, but we just don't keep them like we're supposed to. We fall short, you know. Uh, and not only just doing things, you know, the Ninth and Tenth Commandments cover an, uh, a, a way of thinking, coveting. How many of us break God's commands just by our thoughts that go through our mind? So, um, but now there's a righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah, not self-righteousness, but Christ's righteousness. So, what did God's leading, yeah, he leads our lives. He leads me in the paths of our, what could, did God's leading in David's life look like? You know, when you look back on David's life, um, did God lead David down nice, wide, paths that were paved um, or did he lead him down some really difficult roads 
Remember, for quite a few years after he was anointed to be the next king, Saul hunted David down and wanted to kill him. And David feared for his life, too. You know, even hid out in Gath, which was the former home of Goliath. I mean, he just figured that Saul was never going to look there, and he really didn't. But, uh, yeah, even though God was leading his life, he went through hard times. What does that remind us of? We can expect as Christians to go through hard times, too. You know, we, we should never think, oh, my goodness, you know, I am uh, going to go through easy times now that I'm Christian. Uh, nope. David went through some very difficult times. And he paid for some of his own sins, too, when some of the things that have, had happened, right? Committed adultery with Bathsheba. That child died. Um, and his own sons kind of turned against him. Maybe they saw what dad had done and, you know, committed adultery like dad did. Hi, Candace, and Barclays, and Hesemans, and Gillies. Glad you could join us this morning. Um, yes, yeah, so God leads us, but that path is not always a better road. It can be very challenging. And it's notable in the Bible, God's people are always a minority in the Bible. They're always a remnant, never a majority. You know, in the world as a whole, God's people are always a remnant people. That's uh, kind of the way it has been, probably the way it's going to continue to be as well. So uh, verse 4a, this is the first part of that. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I've always thought that's a wonderful picture of death, isn't it? That we're just walking through death. As if walking through a shadow. How much does it hurt to walk through a shadow? Eh, you know, dark for a moment and you get out of it in the flight. And the picture is here. Much like the thief on the cross, you know, Jesus said to the thief on the cross today, you'll be with me in paradise. Um, so also, when we die, what happens? Immediately, we go to heaven. We don't experience what Jesus experienced on the cross. You know, he's paid for our sins. That's, that's a bill that's been stamped, paid. Um, so we're just walking through the valley of the shadow of death and on to eternal life. You know, it's kind of amazing to think about, isn't it? No matter how old you are, you are going to be alive through faith in Jesus Christ. Alive from now on and forever. Yeah, there's never a point where you're going to be dead or gone. You're going to either be alive here on earth or alive in heaven. Just a tremendous thing to think about. We walk through the valley of the shadow of death. For thou art with me. I kind of like that word thou. Just a king's English to speak of God. He's more than a you. He's a thou. For thou art God. Or for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. There's been a bit of debate about, you know, were these two different instruments that shepherds used? Some have said, you know, the rod was, okay, the shepherd needs to be tapped on its rear end to get moving. You would use your rod. And the staff, that's the thing we normally think of as a crook on it. Um, that would be something that the shepherd would use to rescue. And some have given the picture, you know, God uses his law. That's more like the rod to punish us. And God uses the gospel, more like the staff, to rescue us when we've fallen into a ravine someplace. Um, for thou art with me. Yeah, you're with me. God is with us at all times. Can a Christian really ever say they're alone? Yeah, no, not really. You know, we're really never alone. God is with us. And uh, here we are, his rod and his staff. They comfort me. Yeah, both are there. Someone has shared the story, and I've never been able to verify it, that sometimes these wandering sheep um, that constantly wandered, the shepherd you know, would take these, usually they're young lambs, still learning their way. He'd just get tired of chasing. After a while, he'd just break their leg one of their legs, so they couldn't wander anymore. And then he might carry that sheep around in his neck for a while. Uh, he just didn't want to chase it. He wanted that lamb to 
learn its way and you know he'd bandage up that leg so it would heal again but it was his way of teaching that lamb not to get into trouble and go places it wasn't supposed to i mean that rod was used like that sometimes verse five and now we kind of changed transition here you know we went from the shepherd to more uh, a table setting and we almost have to picture you know out in these days there were shepherds who wandered the fields there were like the bedouins today that's still a community people who really don't own their own land they just wander out in the desert and try to find places where their uh, animals can graze and they're kind of protected by the israeli and syrian governments and they're allowed to do what they their families have done for years sometimes those uh, families now own satellite dishes and have electricity and uh, own a jeep uh, but they still live in tents out there so now we kind of get a different picture here. thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies thou anointest my head with oil my cup runneth over my cup overflows yeah so the the theme here is kind of now changed to host and guest some have tried to picture oh, okay maybe the shepherds laid down some food on a piece of cloth out in the field and that was like a table and uh, they would pour some water into a cup or a sheep to drink well I guess it could happen but I think better it's just a picture that there's a change in the picture here of somebody who's been invited into a house as a, as a house guest and they're given generous treatment here um, according to the Bedouin law of hospitality once a traveler comes into your tent and especially once his host has spread food before him, he is guaranteed protection from his enemies. Yeah, you can't come in and do anything right now. It's kind of like you're in a safe house. And also with God. You know, we're in a safe house with him when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan really can't attack us free will. Um, you know, we have the power to say no to Satan's temptation and so here is the lord has granted us some protection from satan and uh, not in all respects that we're not going to have a worry-free life but satan can't do whatever he wants to uh, anointing one's head with oil that was kind of a special a precious commodity and oil was expensive you know that was our fuel that was our candle light so if you wanted to stay up late after the sun went down if you didn't have any candle oil uh, forget it right or wax and normally reserved for kings that they would pour oil on their head and filling cup to overflowing that would be generosity in these days when they're trying to trying to preserve every crumb of bread you know the drink that they had there just a picture that this host is really being the host and God takes care of his people with generosity uh, Jesus says you know I'm the vine you are the branches if you abide with me you shall bear much fruit right apart from me you can do nothing so uh yeah thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies you anoint my head with oil my cup run it over so um surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and i will dwell in the house of the lord forever so some kind of even translate this surely grace and mercy shall follow me surely goodness and mercy kind of along the same lines you know what is grace receiving a gift we don't deserve that's what grace is God's riches at Christ's expense we're getting something that we really don't deserve what's mercy it's not receiving the punishment that we do reserve yeah so surely goodness and be grace and mercy shall follow me you know we get good god good gifts from god that we don't deserve and we also get his mercy he doesn't give us the punishment that we deserve because jesus has paid the price for that sin that we've committed um, you know there's a greek proverb that says after three days both fish and guests begin to smell or stink you ever heard that one <laughs> well not in this psalm you know what does it say here you know uh, i'll dwell in the house of the lord forever yeah god never gets tired of us our family might god doesn't 
And so we're uh, dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. And I put a little true and false here. So true or false, David was able to enjoy some time during his life in the temple, the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. What's the answer to that? Did he ever get to go into the temple? What do you think, Renee? Did he ever get to go into the temple? No, yeah, you're right. Never the one that Solomon built. Just the tabernacle, the tent temple. Uh, no, the temple didn't get completed until David was dead and Solomon started construction on it. So uh, when David was talking about, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, he wasn't talking about the earthly temple. He was talking about heaven that he was going to enjoy. And uh, boy, was that quite the place. Tons and tons and tons and tons of gold and silver used in that place. Uh, so when all is said and done, you know, we have to, Remember the words of John chapter 10, where Jesus starts talking to us in words of sheep and shepherds. You know, Jesus said, I am what? The good shepherd, right? I am the good shepherd. And, and it's interesting, in order to become the good shepherd, in order to become a shepherd, Jesus first had to become a sheep, right? He's the lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. Yeah, he had to become a lamb, led like a lamb to the slaughter, Isaiah says, in order to be our good shepherd yet today. Uh, one more little thing here, you know, in, in Spanish especially, and I think we actually have a couple people watching us from Honduras here today. Um, you know the word pastor? Uh, cuando una persona habla pastor, um, Es uh, como una persona que trabaja con las ovejas. And, uh, the word pastor means shepherd. You know, somebody who works with sheep. So what does that have to say to us as pastors? Um, what's our task? Are we CEOs, CFOs? No. We need to stay away from looking at this like a business. Yeah, we, we really are under shepherds of the good shepherd, right? And we're taking, we're given the important task of taking care of God's sheep. Are we perfect like the good shepherd? No, not at all. And you should never lament too much that your pastor is not perfect. He's just trying to point you to the perfect shepherd, Jesus Christ. He's the one who's the good shepherd. So let's close and let's say a word of prayer. Okay, thanks for joining us today, and we'll continue next week with another song. At some point, we're going to go back to Bible school, uh, or excuse me, Bible, Bible class as normal here, and we'll see if we can set up a camera for that and we continue with the song. But uh, we'll at least have one more week of this. So let's say, and I think we're doing Psalm 37, I believe. Uh, let's say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word and promises and how wonderful it is to know that you are our good shepherd, that you provide for us, your sheep, and that you are a shepherd who is willing to lay down his life for us on the cross. So also help us to be people have, who have grace and mercy towards others, you know, the, the lost sheep who are out there, that we might be searching after the one who's not part of the a flock of 99 that's already saved and uh, so be with us lord a lot of hurting people out there spiritually hurting maybe physically eating hurting because of uh, the pandemic uh, just use us as your servants to share the good news of god's grace and mercy in jesus's name amen have a blessed sunday thanks for joining us everyone bye-bye